I want to start off by saying thank you to everybody. I appreciate all your support, and none of this would be possible without you. I also want to thank God for the inspiration and the insight to see. Thank you, Lord, highest of high, creator of creation. Welcome. I hope you enjoy. And I think it could all be summed up pretty quickly. Things that we have talked about, and that is that there's this great reset, emitting a plasma destruction across this realm. And before I go on any further, as always, I don't know. But from what I have gathered, is this event will happen around the winter solstice. And perhaps it could happen in the summer solstice. But even with all the preparation in the world, one could not be sitting in one's desired, prepared point at all times. But one should still prepare. And if we are dealing with a great plasma storm, we would of course want to avoid metal. In any kind of scenario where such a plasma event would be upon us, we would have to tie ourselves off to a rock with climbing rope to avoid being sucked up in this reset event. And of course that we should have food and water and not keep them in any metallic or plastic containers, leaving you with animal bladders and various vessels of a natural nature. And I think we should all be living in such a independent fashion, growing as much food as we can, having chickens, and ultimately be living off the grid doesn't mean you can't engage in the affairs of man and enjoy what can be enjoyed. But when you go back home, you're living as free and detached from the system as possible. And of course, I wrote a book on this, and you can check it out in the link below. But really, very little will matter after an event like this. And most of the elite do have underground bunkers, but they are lined with rebar. And they'll be absolutely cooked out. And knowing very well that most people will not find a rock area and tie themselves off with rope, and even if they had managed to secure such a situation, when the moment happens, one might not be in the right place at the right time. And in short, I thought and have thought for a long time about this subject matter. I've thought about housing and affordable housing for everyone. And I've mentioned in past videos, my favorite material is concrete, but not liking the rebar idea for different reasons. And upon examining this subject, it's brought me back to construction. Construction even of the old world without using rebar and superior concrete that survives beyond anything that we make today. And what I imagine is a little igloo, a little concrete igloo a little dome, a monolithic dome, sometimes they're called. But I'm imagining a small pod. If you have a family of five, five pods, or even some larger ones. And constructed with concrete, but instead of using rebar, we use this. This is the future of concrete. These are reinforced concrete fibers. As we can see here at this website, all things fibers. And this essentially replaces rebar. Very high tech, in my opinion. And I'm hoping to call my local concrete company and see if they have these synthetic fibers. They can be added right into the mix. And now you can just pour. Yes, yeah, so I was wondering if you had the tough fibers that can be added to concrete. Uh, yes, I do. You do? And, uh, and how much extra is it to add that in? Um, well, I guess, what you said, are you, you talking about what kind of fiber? Oh, I mean, how do you, you're the CEO, saying, oh, oh, not. It's like a fiber and it replaces rebar? They say you don't... Well, it, fiber doesn't replace rebar, but yes, people do put fiber in their concrete to help the surface intactment and the flexibility of the concrete. The fibers you have will not replace the rebar. Well, it's... For what you read on in the, on a online, mm -hmm. 
and everything else, I mean, it's, I guess it's, it's all within the holes of the beholder. Uh-huh. Typically, you said people do one pound of fiber per yard? Correct. Okay. And so I... You can't I, go on higher dosages if you want. That's fine. I can. It would just be $6, a... Six dollars a pound is what we charge for it. Six dollars a pound. Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate your help. Hey, no problem. So excellent. Even in my small, primitive town, we're able to get this fiber added in. You could sculpt, or in the case for these reset pods, these monolithic domes, anywhere from 4 to 10 feet in height, could be placed a little distance from the home and anything metal and have a small opening, like a doghouse, and something that could easily be crawled into to avoid being sucked off, and something heavy enough that would stay on the ground. Very exciting, and the future. And surely I will be building with this. And now we just simply need to sculpt a mold. One could use wood, but not metal screws or nails. Maybe wooden dowels to make your shape. And then again, it got me thinking of the old world. And let's just have a little look at something that this reminded me of. So these little things that we see everywhere. Obviously a tower as well. A tower and these strange little, of course, what they would call tombs or temples. And they seem to fare very well through the resets because we still see them better than this whole temple did it looks like but who knows what this was this could have just been a courtyard and so here's one for example and there's lots of these sometimes i like to call them bird houses it almost looks like a giant mailbox but nevertheless we see a little chamber in here and how large is this i don't know i don't have any scale but it's exactly what i imagine and perhaps one solid piece forming a concrete birdhouse on the ground. And here we can see the fibers. No rebar, which even without considering the reset has a tendency to erode over time. And this was, in short, my idea of how one could easily survive a reset. Of course, nothing is easy, but a little six foot monolithic dome wouldn't cost more than $300 in concrete and something that I look forward to building and sharing with you. And I believe the old world was using something like this. Some fibrous material that would strengthen every square inch of your concrete. And in this particular example, we don't care about the finish. And as far as I'm concerned, this is the future of construction. Now we can begin to shape and mold structures much easier simply by creating forms and filling them with this concrete reinforced with this fiber from the floor to the walls to the roof keeping a dome shape of course using the natural strength of the shape and this is very exciting news i think this spring i'll begin experimenting with this cutting edge technology as simple as it seems and more importantly what led me to this subject was to help our community farewell in the next event whenever that may be so recently i just went to this place the old mammoth mine in utah i didn't go to this particular spot but i went to several others and this guy took some excellent drone footage and I want to show you this hole in this mountain. Perhaps we'll get into the history. I've touched on it before. Silver City being the center. And we have the Mammoth Mines seen here. And the Silver Mine. And the Goshen Mines. And there was also an amazing little city that I'll show you. That I drove through. Absolutely fascinating brick town in ruins. But right now I just want to get this out. I pay for fast internet, and yet I don't get it, as you can see here. And maybe we'll just jump ahead a little. So here we go. This, we're told, was carved out by people looking for silver. I think what it's lacking is a giant tailing pile. But not the point today. 
I want to compare this to a place in China that we've looked at before, and that's right here. And I think that's what we're looking at. Just a giant, hollow depression under this mountain. Not a mountain at all. Rather something like this. A building. And I'm very thankful that we have such examples as this. Otherwise, we wouldn't know what we're looking at when we see things like this. And, of course, mainstream geology would tell us this had to do with lava and some big gas bubble, perhaps. And that would be fine if we hadn't seen something like this before. And now I think we can also be certain that these seeming mountains behind here contain the same such cavities. Of course, I don't know, but I'm pretty certain. I'm not sure about you guys, but images seem to be unavailable, especially a lot of maps. It seems like they're pulling them down quickly. A lot of blank spots, as if there's not already enough gaps in our narrative. I'm looking at this old famous Union Stockyard, just like any of the designations that we see. No different with these old cattle stockyards. Here we go. Driving the cattle in and out of this castle. This is just the entrance. I see some kind of tech up here. And this would be in the 1850s. And I was just thinking about the production of food. Just a simple World's Fair. Thinking from a restaurant or food and beverage perspective. How are we going to feed all these people and keep all the meat and dairy cold, transport it? Just considering the St. Louis World's Fair, it was an hour out of the city on horse. And when you get your food permit, you quickly learn there's a temperature danger zone of only a couple hours before bacteria begins to grow. I think a lot of it is fear generated. I've experimented with this and found that it varies, similar to the expiration date on the milk in your fridge. But nevertheless, in the winter, this might be less of a problem when it comes to shipping meat around, as it could just freeze. But what about the World's Fairs? They were not held in the winter. Some of them were. Here's a photo saying when Chicago was the hog butcher to the world. I don't know if I can show these things. This is history and reality. And here's a look at this stockyard. And we see a castle. And really seeming like some farming center for the old world. Again, to lay out a city like this. Maybe this is 10 to 20 acres. And here we have the people. And this is primitive. You're not creating this perfect grid with these primitive means in the 1850s. Similar to Utah, where Brigham Young was said to lay out the grid, the entire city grid, beginning with a stick. He went out and drew lines in the dirt. Impossible. And Salt Lake is perfect. It would require very sophisticated surveying and heavy equipment to cut out such a perfect square grid. And I was gonna read a little the history of agriculture going back for hundreds of thousands of years, and I'm not interested in going back this far. We begin in 1798. The economist Thomas Malthus warned that population growth would outpace food production, setting the stage for widespread starvation. History is no stranger to this scenario. Depleted farmland and changing climates set the stage for famines throughout much of Europe from 1300 to 1850. So really struggling till 1850 and then suddenly boom. From 1900 to 2011, the population grew from 1.6 billion, the entire population, 1.6 billion, to 7 billion. Hunger still remains a crisis, largely because 
food is not evenly distributed across the population, and much of the world's food supply is never eaten. The number of farms grew from 1.4 million in 1850 to 4 million in 1880, and 6.4 million in 1910, then started to fall. And by 1950, we only have 2.2 million. It's so very interesting that it seems to peak in 1910. We're told when the pilgrims arrived, they almost died. They didn't know how to eat. And it was the natives that saved them. Showed them how to eat turkey and yams and cranberries, which would eventually lead to pumpkin pie. Really being clueless is my point. And... I think today, even more clueless than ever. At least back then, people seemed to know how to grow food, and certainly the natives knew how to survive off of the land, hunting. And today, most people know nothing, and would surely die if they had to provide for themselves. And what of this early time period? What were people eating? We discovered the hot dog was introduced in the 1900s at the St. Louis World's Fair. And for whatever reason today, this was on my mind. I watch the economy go on around me. Shipping, what it requires, large trucks, servicing restaurants and supermarkets daily. Supermarkets are said to run out of food in two days, if not resupplied. And so again, it takes me back to this early time period. I find it almost impossible. But yet I think people were more resourceful. This picture is pretty mind-blowing. And I'm just gonna tie this in with something super weird. When we talk about the early, early reset and what may have happened to all the people, why we see no traces, and I think what we see are these catacombs found all throughout. And what is the purpose of these catacombs? Just strange and sick to consider anybody decorating with bones. And I think that these were a food source for some entities. And we also have discussed that these could be used as batteries and may have been as well, creating and conducting a charge. But if that's the case, something else is even more mysterious than that. And it's why are these bones so polished and clean? Very difficult to polish and clean a bone where there's no skin or hair, or in the case of the skull, nothing inside the brain. In modern times, they use beetles and berry bones. And I once soaked a coyote skull that I found that still had hair and junk inside the head in bleach and was able to bleach clean the skull. But something like this, to pick a bone clean? Go ahead and try to clean a chicken bone next time you have the opportunity. A real mess, a lot of stuff clings to bone. And I'm not really sure what happened to that last part, but next I wanted to just talk about a fireplace and the importance of having a fireplace. Even if you live on the grid and have conventional utilities, you never know when those utilities could go down. And people with a fireplace, especially if you're in a cold area in the winter, can be the difference between life and death. And this little stove I paid $175 for. The company is Vogelzong. And it's a little boxwood stove. It's amazing. I've been using this tiny little stove for 15 years. And I hope to upgrade eventually. There are better stoves, but just to show you, you don't need much more than this. It came in a box about the size of the box itself and I had to assemble the legs, all the parts were inside. Absolutely awesome. And going back to our bee or wasp honey, 
Here Ralph Winter tells us that the Mexican honey wasp is a commonly known thing and a producer of honey. And here a populace of people not only have this wasp honey on their menu and a staple for sustainability, but 17 other species of insects in their diet. Oftentimes the larvae are eaten, and my dog really loves eating the wasp itself, snatching them out of the air like candy. So very good to know, confirming this, and I've still yet to try it. I hope you enjoyed today's video, and do have a blessed day. Please like, comment, and subscribe.